So there's been an, an enormous amount of discussion about um, the, uh, the equal opportunity implications of AI and of emerging technologies. Um, this panel uh, wants to take a different approach. This panel wants to look at the emerging technologies and artificial intelligence and predictive analytics, uh, but wants to really frame it in the context of um, our professional responsibility as lawyers and what types of issues are implicated um, by the emerging technology. So I think it'll be a very interesting discussion. And we have panelists from you know, a broad range of perspectives. We're actually missing one today. Brad Newman is not here. Um, his papers in the materials, his papers, a fascinating uh, call for legislation. Um, so I suggest that you all read it because um, we're looking for uh, uh, answers in terms of whether we need to change the regulatory um, regime, whether the current one is sufficient. Um, so it's a, it's a healthy contribution, uh, but um, the trial calendar called and he wasn't able to join us today. Um, we're going to, uh, let me just briefly introduce the panel. The bios are in the, the, bios are in the program, so I'm not going to go into great detail, but I just want to introduce the panel so you see sort of the diversity that we have on the panel. Um, we're going to start out with uh, Julia Stojanovic, who's an assistant professor in the Department of Computer Science and Engineering at the Tandon School of Engineering and the Center for Data Science at NYU. So she's a computer scientist, and one of the things that I have found to be very, very productive about these conferences is to get the computer scientists and the lawyers together because it really, I think, sparks a lot of creativity. It sparks a lot of insight um, into the discussions, and she's going to lead off her conversation um, with, I think, some big picture uh, observations about the technology, and then later, I think, talk about issues of transparency. Um, next is uh, Aria Friedman. Aria Friedman, uh, for the past eight years, has been the chief privacy officer and is currently the chief compliance officer at Dun & Bradstreet, a global, global business data and analytics company. Um, he's been very aggressive necessarily um, in this space, um, and he'll talk about um, the work he's doing uh, in the corporate, um, the corporate sphere. Um, and then we have, I have all these marked off. Um, here's the next one. Uh, then we have um, Aisling McAllister, who is um, a uh, partner at Bond, Shenick and King. She's a counselor and a litigator in the Labor and Employment Department. She represents clients on employment-related matters. So she is the management side voice, the management side litigator. I actually think we're going to find a lot of overlap and a lot of agreement on this panel, but she brings that voice. And I won't even use the book for this guy. Uh, this is Adam <laughs> Klein. He's my former partner um, at Outman and Golden. He's currently the managing a partner at Outman and Golden, and really, I think, one of the most uh, brilliant and, and creative minds, uh, certainly on the plaintiff side, and has thought tremendously and taught me an enormous amount about, uh, about this uh, area of the law. So we'll start out with Julie. Okay. Thank you for the introduction, and it's uh, my pleasure to be here. I'm uh, a computer scientist by training, and I'm only slightly terrified to be speaking in front of a room full of lawyers. Uh, and so I will surely overcompensate by speaking too fast. <laughs> um, and I have to speak too fast because my task is to uh, tell all of you about data and AI and personal and professional responsibility pertaining to labor and employment in 15 minutes. Um, so why did I decide to come here and to tell all of you about this? Uh, of course, we all talk about uh, being in silos, right? The technologists talk among technologists about the ways in which we should be impacting society, and lawyers and others talk among themselves, and there isn't really a lot of uh, cross-fertilization. And in particular, we all feel that data science practitioners, that decision makers, that members of the public don't understand data and AI and data science sufficiently. So it's on us, on members of my profession, to really come out and uh, try and uh, educate you guys. Um, so tell me if, if anything that I say is not understandable, and I'm happy to engage in a, in a discussion. Right, so of course the compulsory slide, and by the way, in what I'm going to say, I'm building, of course, on all the wonderful things that were said before me today, and in particular by two women, by Pauline and by Jenny just now. So you can consider this as a kind of a follow-up on these two wonderful talks. 
Uh, why are we using AI? Why are we using data science? Well, it's because there is potential here to make things more efficient, to make things better, to make things more fun, more accessible, more equitable in society, right? Uh, and I believe that, in fact, that, that potential can be realized, but we must be careful about the kinds of risks and dangers that this technology brings. And this is why we're at the table here today. Uh, so the bad news, of course, and I'm going to just very briefly highlight some cases that I'm sure you know about and that have a common theme. Uh, so this was one of the earlier studies from 2015 that sh showed that ads for high paying jobs were shown way significantly more likely to men than they were to women. Um, in 2015, things of course didn't uh, get fixed. This is a more recent study from late 2018 that was also mentioned today, uh, where Amazon first developed uh, a very expensive and very sophisticated hiring tool, AI-based hiring tool, and then they decided to scrap it because the tool essentially picked up gender bias based on some historical data that the tool was trained on, right? Um, so another example, and I don't believe that this was mentioned, and that is related also to employment, to employment opportunities, is a study that was done back in 2012 or 2013 by Latanya Sweeney, a computer scientist who is African-American, she teaches at Harvard, uh, who found that when she Googles her name, she gets ads from Instant Checkmate asking her whether she wants to see her own arrest record. Have you seen this study? Right. So this is a tremendous problem, right? It's a tremendous reputational harm uh, it was actually shown, she showed by means of a well-designed and rigorous study that it is the fact that her name was racially identifying. Her first name, Latanya, is more commonly given to African-American babies in the U.S. than it is to white babies, that these ads were shown. It didn't have anything to do with the person actually having or not having a criminal record. So when a potential employer Googles your name and they see an ad like this, they think Google knows what they're talking about. Instant Checkmate knows what they're doing. They wouldn't be wasting money and impressions if there wasn't some truth behind this, right? So this is a problem for the purposes of employment, among other things. Um, this was also mentioned just now by Jenny, I believe. So this is uh, uh, an article describing that there is actually a correlation between mental disability and people not passing automatic uh, job screening personality tests. Um, and why is this happening? Well, many of these tools, they are AI, artificial intelligence. They use machine learning, a set of techniques that learns the rules of operation based on data. So there are particular kinds of rules that these techniques are built to be able to learn. But what actual rules they learn, you know, what is the difference between somebody who will perform well on the job and somebody who won't? Which features of these people do we pick? What are the values of these features? What is the required SAT score, for example, for success? This is something that these tools pick up from data. And how do they get this data? Well, this data is a reflection of the world. It's a reflection of our own historical and current biases, right? So this is a pretty old study that shows us that there is, in fact, innate bias um, in terms of uh, how likely somebody is going to be called for an interview and be employed based on race as well as based on gender. And the problem persists. This is a more recent study that looks at the impact of race on how likely somebody is to be called in for an interview. And this is a very nice chart, uh, a terrible chart, but a very clear chart <laughs> that shows that uh, African-Americans who whiten their resumes <coughs> get called back for interviews two and a half times more likely than do those who do not widen their resumes. And that's a very similar trend holds among uh, Asians. So it's 21 versus 11% of callbacks. So these disturbing trends are still there. They're in the data. They are in these algorithmic techniques and algorithmic systems that we are trained, that learn based on that data. And so this is the reality with which we now have to deal head on to try and understand where the problems are coming in and what we can do to mitigate them. Uh, a study that is very, very important for us to look at and that does not rela directly relate to the focus of this conference, to labor and employment, is one that was uh, published by ProPublica about racial bias in the use, uh, use of risk assessment tools in the criminal justice system. Have you guys seen this? Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you have not, your homework for today, if this is the only thing that you retain, 
is to go home and read, read this, this, this article uh, that essentially shows to us that today in the public sector, in the criminal justice system in particular, we are using tools that we procure from private companies. These tools are black box. We don't know how they work, how they were validated, and yet we use them in courts in this case. So this particular tool, it takes as input information about an individual, uh, and it produces a number, a risk score, a number between one and 10, that suggests to a judge how likely that individual is to recidivate. And they use, judges use this score to then decide whether to release a person on bail pending trial, how to set the bail amount, and how to sentence them if they're found guilty. Now what this study showed by looking at the inputs to the tool, at the predictions that it made, and then three year, years down the road, whether the individuals were actually rearrested, which is a proxy, a conservative proxy for reoffense, they found that the tool is very often inaccurate, but also, perhaps even more disturbingly, that the kinds of mistakes that it makes are very racially biased. This tool was blatantly <coughs> racist, and we will go into this in a bit more detail. And we are still using this tool and others of this kind in courts today. Um, so what is common between all of these examples? Well, what we're talking about here is bias, as I'm gonna put it in quotes because I want to unpack what I mean by bias, in the use of a particular kind of a tool, a predictive analytic. What is a predictive analytic? It's a tool that tries to predict the future based on some past information, on historical information about employment, for example or recidivism. Uh, so the way that we look or think about these tools is that there is a data set that the tool takes as input. Then there is some magic that happens and I'm showing a neural network here just so. And then the tool makes some kind of a prediction. For example, in this example, we are splitting people up into different groups for, uh, to, to receive particular services, to receive uh, particular risk scores, etc. Right, so belonging to a group presumably makes a difference to an individual who is in this data set, positively or negatively. So when we talk about bias, statisticians have been using the term bias for a very long time in a different sense than the sense in which ProPublica's investigation is using bias and in which we have been using bias here today, I think. So statistical bias means that you have a data set and then you have a model. For example, you're trying to figure out how to separate your examples into the good and the bad ones by means of drawing a line in a two-dimensional space. And that model, the drawing of the line, simply doesn't fit the data well. There does not exist a single line that you can place that would actually separate the good cases from the bad cases. So this is statistical bias. This is not what we mean here, however. What we are talking about here is that there is societal bias in the data. What might that mean, sir? It may mean, for example, that there is a world and essentially data is a picture of that world, right? It may be the case that we're taking a very distorted picture of the world by means, for example, of non-representative sampling. So in the use of predictive policing, for example, we would be sending police cars constantly to the same neighborhoods. And these are typically neighborhoods in which uh, people of color live. And so we would be oversampling. We would be taking a distorted picture of the world in that sense. We would be oversampling from that demographic. What about in employment? Historically, we know women haven't really been uh, working in the technology sector as much, right? So in that sense, our data is non-representative of the overall population because a particular gender is simply not represented sufficiently in that data. Um, so there may be non-representative sampling, there may be measurement error that is systematic, but another interpretation of bias is that it may be the case that we're taking a perfect picture of the world, but the world itself is distorted. The world is somehow incorrect. And so importantly, when we look at the data set and we think that there's bias in the data set, for example, somehow there aren't enough women in it. By looking at the data set itself, we cannot tell whether it's an imperfect picture or whether the world is imperfect. <laughs> so observational data in itself is limited. It doesn't know what it doesn't contain and it doesn't know why that is. Does this make sense? Right? 
So here's a pictorial representation of this. So there is such a thing as a world, an ideal world, a world as it could or it should be. And of course, we are not going to agree in this room or in the society what that world looks like, but I think that we all agree that the world could be improved. So this ideal and perhaps non-existent world as it should be is up there. And then there is some retrospective injustice applied to this world. And we present with the world as it is today. Now from this world, we can further sample in a way that is non-representative. And then we get the world according to data. And of course, when our data is biased and this data is about individuals, then this bias leads to discrimination. And I'm not going to tell a room full of lawyers what discrimination is. I'm sure that you could educate me on this. Um, three minutes? Right. OK. <coughs> so let me tell you now uh, how we operationalize bias and fairness in AI, starting with the very simplest example, and that is classification. So what is classification? And in particular, I'm looking at binary classification. Um, so I have a data set of individuals. A vendor processes that data set, and they want to decide which of the individuals get a positive outcome, for example, they are offered employment, and which get a negative outcome. They are not offered employment. So pictorially, it's represented like this, a population of individuals, an individual is a dot, and then there is a certain number of dots I can assign, pluses I can assign. These are the positive outcomes, the people who got the job or got invited for an interview. There are only so many pluses I can give. It's a resource constrained environment. Uh, and then I have here individuals with a positive outcome and those with a negative outcome. Make sense? Now, fairness in classification is concerned with how these outcomes are assigned to subpopulations. So here I have a data set of black and white individuals, and I see that 40% of the whole population have a plus, four pluses out of 10. But I'm seeing that only one out of five blacks has a plus, yet three out of five whites have a plus, right? So just percentage wise, there is a difference here. And this is a case where we call it statistical parity, statistical parity fails, or it may be something that we should investigate for disparate impact. Um, now, statistical parity, we call group fairness, or it's a particular kind of a group fairness measure. It says that demographics of the individuals receiving any outcome should be the same as demographics of the underlying population. And for me to achieve statistical parity here, and this of course is the simplest measure, there are many much more sophisticated ones uh, that have been developed, but this, this one is the simplest to explain. Uh, to achieve statistical parity, given that I can only give four pluses, I have to take away a plus from somebody who, uh, who had a plus before and give them a minus, and that's the bottom left there. And I have to reassign that plus to somebody on the top right. And so what happens here is that although I am achieving statistical parity now, I have an equal number of pluses for black and for white, the individual who is similar to others who had a positive outcome and now has a negative one has a reason to complain. They say, I look very similar to everybody around me. Why did, that get, why did they get into college and I did not? So this is the basic tension between individual fairness and group fairness. Uh, and this is a picture of that, right? So equality is individual fairness, equity is group fairness, roughly speaking. Equity costs more, we need more boxes, but then everybody can reach the other three. And these are two intrinsically different worldviews that cannot mathematically be reconciled and that we cannot logically argue about. And this, by the way, is news to us in computer science, <laughs> right? I mean, you guys have all known this. Why is this news to us? It's because the way that we grow up is to solve problems for which there is a solution. And it's a solution that we can validate as being correct. There is such a thing as correct. For an algorithm, always, there is such a thing as correct. For a society, not necessarily, right? Society is about trade-offs. Democracy is about trade-offs. Equity and equality are about trade-offs. And this is the basic difficulty in the use of algorithms and data uh, in a way that impacts society. And these are the real trolley problems. They are not about autonomous vehicles and whom they should run over. They are really about how we uh, reconcile these irreconcilable notions and how we operationalize them in code. Uh, and this perhaps I'm gonna skip, 
so this is about, this says that these are axiomatic differences. They're not something that we can really check. Uh, by looking at the data, whether or not there is some systematic distortion that made it so that people, when they present uh, to an employer, their demographics actually influence how their, their achievement as presented by, say, their test scores, right? So whether or not you trust the data as an employer depends on whether or not you think that there was some systematic distortion that made it so that people who were born in less fortunate circumstances are now able to achieve less in terms of SAT scores and GPAs, et cetera. Um, let me tell you just very, very briefly, in one minute perhaps, or two, if I have the time, about fairness in risk assessment. So what we looked at before was classification, just pluses and minuses, right? And people are in two groups, advantaged and disadvantaged. Now, New Jersey recently uh, passed a bail reform, a comprehensive bail reform. And part of that reform is that judges are now compelled to use software similar to the software that ProPublica investigated. It's a different piece of software, it's called PSA, uh, that was developed with uh, funding from the Arnold Foundation, that likewise outputs a score. And then a judge has to take that score under advisement and sentencing and setting bail amounts in particular. And if they disagree in their decision with what the system suggests, they have to document that in writing. So guess how often judges disagree? Not very often, right? So now, uh, this is actually viewed by the defenders as something that is very positive. And I'm quoting here from a manual, the New Jersey Pretrial Justice Manual, authored by the ACLU and other good people, uh, that says, switching from a system based solely on instinct and experience to one in which judges have access to scientific, objective risk assessment tools could further the criminal justice system's central goals of increasing public safety, et cetera, et cetera. Now, it's very, very dangerous for us as a society, for uh, the, the defenders and for the judges to hold the belief that these tools are objective and that they are scientific. And this is not only because evidence lacks of these tools having actually been validated. This particular tool, we don't know what the validation was that it underwent. But also because it is in principle impossible to be fair and objective in making risk assessment decisions in a world that is unfair. And for this, we have a mathematical proof. And I just want to show this to you very quickly. Um, so what is risk assessment? And why do you guys care? I mean, we all care because we are people in a society, right? But risk assessment is a general kind of a tool that essentially tries to predict a future event, to give a probability estimate of a future outcome. Will someone succeed at their job? Yes or no, what is the probability? This is a risk assessment tool. And here the recidivism prediction is a risk assessment tool. Um, so specifically the result that was observed by the ProPublica uh, journalist is the following. If a predictive instrument, a risk assessment tool, satisfies predictive parity, meaning it's predicting things correctly somewhat. When it says that the probability of something is 40%, it actually is 40% across the board and for each subpopulation, black and white. So if the risk assessment tool is actually doing its job, it's correct. Yet the phenomenon that it's trying to predict has a different incidence in subpopulations. So in this case, the blacks recidivate or are rearrested more often than the whites. Then the tool cannot be fair in the sense that it cannot achieve equal false positive rates and equal false negative rates across the populations. And these rates are listed here, and the difference is quite striking. <coughs> so the white individuals who were labeled high risk but didn't reoffend, these are the false positives, the rate of that is 23.5%. For the blacks, it's 45%. This is a very, very disturbing statistic, right? Both that these are so high, but also the disparity. False negative is flipped. Labeled low risk yet did reoffend. Almost 48% of the whites, 28% of the blacks. Unfortunately, in a society that is unjust, in which rearrests are more frequent in the black population, this disparity is inevitable, right? So we need to understand as a society that this is what risk assessment tools bring. And this is because the world is unjust as is reflected in the data. 
And I'm going to just stop here on this, uh, on this point. Thank you, thank you. And we'll, we'll hear more from Julia <laughs> shortly. Um, Aria, you're the um, Chief Privacy Officer and the uh, Chief Compliance Officer for your company. That's a pretty big role, right? Yes. Um, and, you know, you're centrally responsible for keeping your company out of trouble. How do you approach your job given all of these new technologies and all of the changes that we've talked about at this conference? Good. You anticipate what my role is because it, I look at artificial intelligence in two ways. One is as a tool, as a chief compliance officer. Mm -hmm. So more and more there are AI tools for privacy uh, and, and for compliance. So for privacy, AI tools, AI tools in fact are necessary or helpful in preventing data breaches uh, or knowing what data is vulnerable. Uh, for compliance officers, certainly AI tools to identify red flags and to make some sense of red flags, because human review of red flags uh, is, is imperfect, to say the least, and how to evaluate that, but there are tools out there. So I deal with AI tools that way. Uh, we'll deal with the question of competence when you have to use or should use AI, AI tools. And then secondly, I have clients. I mean, we, we're a big data company, so we use predictive analytics and AI tools as well, and how you counsel your clients in the use of those tools. So in both ways. And it's a growing, uh, growing role of what we do. Uh, so what is AI? And I, I didn't realize that Julia was going to precede me. Uh, but in my world, um, I give you the definition. In, in, in the practice of law and my clients, generally right now we live in a world of narrow artificial intelligence. That is artificial intelligence with specific applications uh, rather than a general AI uh, and mostly in those three categories. I, I wanted to start by saying actually before I, I apologize, I, I have to say this. I am speaking in my own personal capacity and not on behalf of DNB. Uh, so I, I do that as both a compliance officer and a, what I call a recovering litigator uh, <laughs> that, that practices. But I'm also an ethics business ethics professor at the Wharton School. And so what I would like to do is focus both on legal ethics uh, narrowly and then zoom back up to general ethics. Uh, because we have found in the past six months to a year is that governments and, and uh, associations and businesses have actually issued ethical guidelines on how to use AI. And they have done so uh, because the law cannot keep up uh, with the technology. And so the notion is a compliance with the law is not sufficient. You need to comply with broader uh, ethical concepts. I will say that when I deal with this, I, I am dealing with a global company. Uh, and the articulation of ethical values by the EU and the OECD in Australia reflect a Western uh, understanding of virtue concepts of ethics. Uh, not necessarily universal ethics. Uh, so uh, we deal in a world where we have a technology that's global in footprint, the data is global in sourcing, and how you deal with that when you apply it uh, is, is uh, going to be different. But we'll deal with it in terms of, uh, uh, of uh, Western, mostly Western values. Uh, so AI, I'll have to address AI in litigation uh, and the tools we have. The tool we have lived with for a long time uh, and that's definitely a narrow version of AI, is Technology Assisted Review, TAR, or e-discovery, uh, putting in uh, search terms and able to, ident to, to identify responsive documents uh, for litigation. Uh, it's also used in the privacy area if there's a data breach and you're trying to figure out what data has been impacted and who you have to notify, uh, you would use that tool. Uh, legal analytics, uh, we use that uh, when we have a case and we want to find out how to argue our case in front of the judge. There are some very sophisticated tools out there that will tell you what precedence the judge likes, what precedence the judge doesn't like, and what words the judge likes in your brief, how to write your brief uh, to address the judge. Uh, does it deal with some uh, personal tendencies or biases? I don't know what the ethical values of that, but the tools are there. And finally, and not so much in the US, but certainly in the UK, <coughs> Uh, there are actually artificial intelligence tools or predictive tools to say rather than going to court, give your dispute to a machine and the machine will resolve your dispute for you and everybody agrees to abide by that arbitration or mediation process. Uh, I'm going to deal now with the legal, uh, the ethical, professional uh, limitations, but you'll see when I go up to broader ethical concepts that in fact they are consistent with what governments and private companies have identified as ethical imperatives uh, when they deal with AI. Uh, the first is for the need for human and attorney oversight. And human oversight of AI tools is going to be repeated 
uh, both on the general level and on the attorney level, uh, there's a notion among lawyers uh, that when you use your tool, and I'll give you an example in the compliance area, if I use a tool and I know I have a spreadsheet of, of red flags and who I will do business with and who I will not, or whether somebody's going to be a risk for anti-money laundering purposes or not, uh, if the tool spits out an answer, the tendency of a lawyer is to say that must be right. And you just defer in all cases to the AI tool. Well, that violates your legal professional ethic to always rely uh, and to defer to the tool in 2.1, which says, advisor, in, in representing a client, a lawyer shall exercise independent professional judgment <coughs> and render candid advice. In rendering candid advice, a lawyer may, offer, may refer not only to the law, but other considerations such as moral, economic, social, and political factors that may be relevant to the client's situation. Algorithms still don't do that. Uh, and so you have responsibility to do that. And I would argue that the notion of a moral input will bring us back up to uh, the ethical values that uh, various governments have articulated and how or what constrains the use, excuse me, of artificial intelligence. Uh, so that is the first one. The second one is attorney communication and transparency. And again, transparency is something we have been dealing with here uh, already with algorithmic transparency, trying to understand what a black box algorithm uh, actually, the uh, decision making process of it. Model rule 1.4 certainly says to us in communication, we need to inform our clients, uh, for me, my client will be the company, um, about the means by which clients' objectives are to be accomplished uh, and in 5B, explain a matter to the extent reasonably necessary to permit the client to make informed decisions about the representation. To me, this, when I, when I use a tool or the client, customer uses a tool, I give advice, need to understand all the constraints of the tool, the constraints of using the data that they're using, using the algorithms that they're using, implicate that. Uh, the last one is attorney competence and the makeup of in-house legal teams. Um, lawyers, People have said, and I've heard people saying, you know, I'm a lawyer, I don't really understand AI. That's not a defense anymore. You need to understand AI. I sit with my chief data scientist every week for an hour, and we talk about data science issues because as the chief privacy officer, chief compliance officer, I need to understand what the technology is. You need to understand what the technology is. We do work with in-house counsel. We do with legal assistance. It's nice to hire. A, and I'm going to be biased here, a young person, <laughs> and have them work. Uh, and I have some young, young staff who help me, but you cannot defer to them. You are giving the legal advice and legal representation. You need to understand the technology at least sufficiently uh, to be able to provide legal advice, understanding, and not deferring to the knowledge of others. You need to understand what you are dealing with and to be able to give advice based on what you know. Uh, so the broader ethical uh, uh, guidance is businesses, uh, Microsoft, Google, and IBM have issued ethical guidelines, again, mostly Western US-based uh, companies giving their views of ethical guidances. I heard references to in, uh, like IRBs that have internal ethical review boards. Those of you who followed Google or Alphabet, uh, they set up two IRB boards that lasted a month or two, I don't know how long, and they self-imploded. They're very difficult to manage. I understand needing to have transparency by design, privacy by design, but having an internal review board with independent uh, reviewers, first of all, to find independent people in a small field and then to be able to operate is much more difficult than you would think it is. Uh, and so far, as far as I know, I've not been successful. Have you? I'm sorry, somebody's really funny. So, but but it, it, it is a tool. Uh, associations have issued ethical guidances. And governments, uh, the European Union, OECD, and Australia, uh, the two interesting ones are China and the US. Uh, the US NIST has issued a uh, request for uh, information on various issues, some of which deal with the ethical principles. China's uh, sense there's been a private association uh, of Chinese <coughs> groups, to data groups that have issued ethical uh, um, uh, guidance. And then there's been a government-sponsored issue, uh, is issue of, of guidance. They're very different uh, than the US, for example, in the use of facial recognition and the importance of public security and how you use artificial intelligence in that context. Very different approaches by the EU on that uh, and the China guidances on that as well. 
Uh, so what are the ethical issues that have been identified on a larger basis? Uh, the one that's repeated, been repeatedly said here uh, and is identified up front is transparency and explainability. That is, people must be informed when an algorithm is being used uh, that impacts them and they should be provided with information about what data the algorithm uses to make the decisions. This may include the right to know the data used, the logic of the algorithm, uh, and uh, some concern about a black box algorithm. Uh, that is an algorithm which comes out with an output, uh, but we don't know exactly why it came out with the outcome that it came. Um, how you handle the black box algorithm is difficult. The EU guidance suggests that when an explanation as to why a model has generated a particular output or decision uh, is not always possible, other explicability measures, such as traceability, auditability, and transparent communication on system capabilities may be required to protect fundamental rights in the EU. Uh, I would suggest, and I defer to Julia on this one, but one that we have argued about uh, in my company is whether we use reproducibility. So it's a, a scientific, you know, if, if somebody else can reproduce the, the outcomes uh, that your AI tool comes out with, that ought to be, something independent comes out with the same result, that should validate uh, the outcome, even if it's a black box. And the notion is, I mean, we make black box decisions. I make decisions where if you were to ask me to explain why I made my decision, I'm sure I could not be fully transparent as to the data I took in or the output that I made on, on black box, uh, on the decision I made. Uh, but some kind of reproducibility uh, would be helpful. But there are constraints on AI. One is that there's really no universal standard on data capture, curation, and processing techniques to allow for replicability. Uh, and secondly is that experiments often involve uh, humans repeatedly running AI models uh, and they find patterns in data and, and there's a difficulty of whether you have a correlation or a causal connection. Uh, auditability, and I think that that's in some of the writings that have been circulated, is a second auditing results and seeing whether you can identify bias or, or unfairness in the results. The second one is fairness, um, trying to uh, avoid unfair discrimination against individuals, communities, or groups. Uh, and this goes to the issue of bias. There are all kinds of biases in data. There's confirmational bias, measurement bias. Uh, but we're talking about the bias here is bias against groups uh, that need to be protected. Uh, the third one is human oversight or contestability uh, and the right to have a process where a person can challenge uh, the use or output of the algorithm uh, and, and be able to understand why or have a human review uh, when they contest it, the decision. Uh, that's why AI, in fact, should be called augmented intelligence rather than artificial intelligence. This goes back to the lawyer responsibility to whatever the outcome is of the AI to augment it with human judgment. Uh, the next one is privacy. Uh, privacy is uh, uh, of concern. It works a lot of ways. One is uh, uh, data minimization requirements in, in the GDPR and other laws uh, require Im impact the need for uh, using large data sets in AI model training, uh, including the difficulty of identifying which data is important for the integrity and accuracy, accuracy of AI models. And in fact, when I give purposes, you know, when, I, when I collect data, I have to tell people why I'm collecting the data and what the intended uses are going to be. Uh, with AI, it's often the unanticipated correlation, the unanticipated use of the data uh, that gives very good results. Uh, so the extent to which we can, consistent with privacy, uh, also do AI tools, and how it impacts innovation or impacts the ability to use the data uh, is important. And finally, there's technical robustness, or robustness generally in security, and the fact that these large data sets are very attractive to hackers, uh, very, can be misused internally or externally, uh, so it is protection for data cybersecurity, and I also include in this one having risk assessments, and we do risk assessments all the time uh, to try and understand what is the risk of using personal information, but also what's the risks inherent in using uh, AI tools. Uh, I wanted just to do two other ethical issues. One is, as I think I mentioned, um, cultural differences uh, in what is the appropriate use of uh, data. Uh, and the notion, uh, a lot of the Western uh, con uh, articulations of ethics deal with human autonomy uh, and the individual rights, but in other jurisdictions, relational uh, virtues are equally important or more important and need to be evaluated. Uh, uh, secondly is that 
ethical issues can be used by governments. Uh, AI is seen as a tool for national dominance, uh, national economic superiority, and there's some concern that sometimes ethical principles globally can be misused uh, to advantage uh, national uh, actors at the expense of others. And one last issue, the ultimate ethical issue of AI is the impact of AI on employment generally uh, and whether we will all be replaced by machines <laughs> and what is the ethical response to that threat. These government guidances also deal with that, uh, the question of whether we, it's, it's limited to retraining employees or whether there's an obligation to share the benefits uh, of AI with employees through various economic distribution mechanisms, including universal basic income. Uh, so that's a broad and narrow view uh, of AI, uh, generally in a few minutes I had, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Aisley, <laughs> during our discussions, I think we designated you as the management representative, but is yes. it really a management position on this? You're not going to argue in favor of the black box, right? We're all just trying to figure this out. Well, I, no, I'm certainly talking from my experience, right, okay. which is 10 years litigating on the management side, but um, I think the, the, the idea, the takeaway is going to be the types of things that we need to be thinking about in the way that I, I, AI is being used in the employment world, whether that be plaintiff side, management side, or, or other. Um, you know, it, we have been seeing a shift in the laws and in social thinking lately, whether this is a correlation to Me Too and Time's Up, or if it's a result of. Uh, those movements which increase the focus certainly on uh, diversity and the elimination of bias in the workplace. Um, New York City is certainly on the forefront of this. We probably or arguably have one of the most liberal statutes in the country that put uh, a heavier burden on employers in terms of maintaining workplaces free of bias, uh, discrimination and harassment based upon protected characteristics. Um, you know, employers now have to do annual training, uh, lengthy policies and procedures that outline the complaint uh, procedure for employees. There's limitations on confidentiality agreements uh, and se in settlement, confidentiality provisions in settlement agreements. And the statute of limitations, certainly for gender discrimination, uh, was recently just trebled for, um, for the New York City uh, agency reporting, up to three years now. Um, the legal industry has not actually been immune to the effects of this uh, social shift in thinking. Um, as of January 2018, the New York State Bar uh, made diversity, inclusion, and elimination of bias a mandatory CLE training for all practicing attorneys in New York State. So the issue of diversity, discrimination, the elimination of bias are certainly hot topics. They're in the media, politics, all over social media and in the law. Uh, the amount of discrimination, discrimination agency complaints and lawsuits are on the rise with no foreseeable plateau. Um, so we have been seeing, as a result of that, a big push by a lot of industries to focus on diversity and inclusion in hiring and promotion. Uh, the majority of employers today have diversity goals that are and are incentivizing their hiring managers to meet them. As a result, a lot of employers are turning to AI solutions to aid in the elimination of bias in the hiring and promotion process. Uh, so as a result of this being a shift and an important uh, focus for um, employers, it too should be uh, an important and, and, and focused area for their attorneys. Uh, not only do we need to focus on the changes in the law, uh, the trends of the types of cases we're seeing, but um, we have a duty of competency in some states, a duty of tech, uh, technology competence, as well as a duty of advisement, um, all prescribed by the ABA model rules of professional conduct. Arguably, that means that we as attorneys uh, representing employers need to keep ourselves abreast of all of the technology, technological advances that are being used commonly in the workplace, as well as those being used by our clients, with the goal of being able to appropriately advise our clients and obviously to fulfill our ethical and professional responsibilities and obligations. So as a result, I wanted to kind of combine these, 
these ideas today um, and focus on specific ways in which AI is currently impacting or has a real potential to impact diversity, bias, and inclusion, and the impact that may have on an, an employer's exposure and liability. So when you start kind of at, at the very beginning of, of the job process, uh, the language in a job posting, AI is now being used to assess specific language used in job postings to garnish more diversity in the applicant pool. Um, it has been found that certain words have an effect on how many women apply for a job versus how many men apply for a job. So words such as competitive, determined tend to be considered more masculine words and therefore less women tend to apply to positions including those words in the job description. Whereas words such as collaborative and cooperative tend to result in more women applying. So um, the technology has caught up with these, these uh, social phenomenon and there is now software that scans job postings, the language within it, and can highlight some gender specific words. And the idea then is the employer can either choose to change the language or something in the middle to make, some, to make the job posting more gender neutral and get a more diverse applicant pool. So when you first look at this, this tool, um, you know, obviously it's, it's good to be thoughtful uh, in the first instance, even in just in the job posting language to increase the diversity of the applicant pool. It's certainly a positive thing for all employers. Also, if an employer were ever accused of gender bias, whether it be a complaint in an agency or a lawsuit, um, gender bias in the hiring process, the implication of such AI this early in the hiring process certainly would be a benefit to that client and could be used as a partial defense. Um, however, I, I think that a, an employer also has to be mindful not to whitewash the job description too much, right? Um, you still want a pool of applicants that are number one qualified for the job they're going for and also are fully aware of what the job entails um, because you can envision a situation that would not be good for any of your employer clients in which an unqualified person um, comes for the job or gets hired for the job and doesn't have a full understanding of what the, the job entails. Um, the problems for the employer then would be the money and time invested in training that employee and then if, if terminated or if things go wrong, we oftentimes see these things ending up in litigation. So moving on next to the location of job postings, um, the certain companies, and, and I think this may have been touched upon in other panels, so I apologize for any of the overlap, but um, you know, a lot of companies are trying to harness the kind of far-reaching arm of social media and are advertising a lot on social media for, for job, position and job positions. One of the cases that has actually been fully adjudicated in the courts that, re that um, involves AI and job postings involves Facebook. Um, as we all know, Facebook mines a lot of data on its users and targets those users with specific advertisements. Well, the Facebook uh, platform for advertising for jobs allowed an advertiser to go on and click uh, demographics so they could target a very specific group of people with this job, uh, with this job advertisement. As a result, a number of lawsuits uh, came about essentially saying that Facebook's platform was uh, violating Title VII. Uh, in March of 2019, Facebook settled this case um, and also agreed to create a separate advertising platform for employment, housing, and credit advertisers. Uh, which drastically limits their ability to target an audience, therefore limiting the ability to violate uh, anti-discrimination laws. Uh, similarly, a uh, class of workers brought claims under the Age Discrimination of Employment Act, uh, alleging that T-Mobile and Amazon were unfairly advertising jobs on Facebook to the age group of 18 to 38. Uh, and they were saying that this therefore discriminates against uh, the older set of, of applicants. What's interesting about this one and, and something to be noted in terms of management side empl uh, employment attorneys 
is the employers were the actual named defendants in this, as opposed to Facebook being named in the, the earlier case. So there is potential liability just using a tool as it's designed if the design is therefore inherently uh, in violation of a law. Um, this suit is still pending, so we don't know how that's going to um, shake out. But from these examples, you can certainly see that it would be advisable to inform your clients about certain social media platforms, how they work, um, and engage in a discussion about where are they posting their their job listings and what types of things are they allowed to do on those job uh, platforms uh, in order to mitigate or pre prevent them from violating any laws. So next step in the process is obviously applicants, right? Um, and I, I know obviously this was touched upon as well, but a lot of Fortune 500 companies are using AI to scrub resumes. Um, clean of all uh, information that may possibly lead to unconscious bias in the hiring process, including name, address, the school that you graduated from, the year that you graduated. Um, overarching idea is very simple. The less the hiring manager knows, the uh, easier it'll be to make an unbiased decision in the hiring process. However, the, the way that this tool is used is obviously f it's, it's a first round, right? It's, it's utilized only in the review of the resumes. At some point, inevitably, you have to meet the candidate, right? Um, so the information that has now been scrubbed to eliminate bias is now known to the hiring manager. Um, so let's say, uh, hypothetical, let's say you narrow down, based upon uh, completely scrubbed resumes, you narrow down to four for people who are qualified, all equally qualified on paper. Um, at some point, you have to call them in for an interview. So you have two white men in their 30s, you have one African-American man, and then you have a white woman in her 50s. Now, if your hiring decision happens to be one of the white men in their 30s, you are open to uh, discrimination complaints from the African-American man based upon race, from the uh, white woman based upon her age. Um, the argument in both being that they were chosen as equally qualified at one point until their protected characteristics became known to the hiring uh, manager. Now, obviously, I recognize that employers are open to these types of discrimination claims regardless if they use AI in the process or not. Um, however, I think that this type of technology almost puts an emphasis on the timing at which the employer becomes aware of the protected characteristics. And so if a decision is made at that juncture, there is uh, or potentially could be an argument for causation. Um, so also a, uh, another tool that's being used during the interviewing process um, by a lot of major companies, Dow Jones, Unilever, Vodafone, Oracle, they're using the AI and video interviewing tool. Um, I know that that was touched upon in the, the panel before lunch. Um, but just as a brief overview, essentially these interviews are all video based and they allow um, the AI data uh, algorithm basically to read all nonverbal cues, including facial expressions, eye movements, body movements, the details of your clothes, nuances of your voice. Um, and then they use these nonverbal clues as the data points, and they use it as a, uh, a point at which they can assess whether or not this candidate is going to be uh, a productive and um, um, good fit for the job that they're going for. Uh, a lot of these programs do say that they work in conjunction with industrial organizational psychologists to develop the technology and therefore were to trust it in, in more, uh, more in-depth analysis as to whether these candidates are appropriate. Um, they also tout that it helps companies foster diversity and eliminate or mitigate bias in the hiring process. However, a few things stand out to me, and I'd certainly bring these up to clients who are expressing interest in using them. What's the score based on, right? You, when you talk about nonverbal cues, it's a very broad and vague set of characteristics to be judged upon. Um, I personally uh, can think of numerous um, 
numerous nonverbal cues that would be biased indicators in the hiring process. Um, to name a few, the culture, gender, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, well, what's your native language, do you have, I mean, we, it's, it's a multitude of things. As you're sitting here watching me speak today, um, I'm using my hands a little bit, I'm looking up, I'm making eye contact. That is very much a cultural, uh, these are cultural cues. Not everybody, not all women do it, not all, not all speakers will do it. Um, when you talk about the detail of clothing, I mean, you know, you go into that, so somebody who can afford a Brooks Brothers suit, they get a higher score on this than somebody who can't. Um, there's there's a, lot of, a lot of things inherent in this that, that are problematic. Um, and the last one being, which I know has been raised before, who is, who is setting who the ideal candidate is, right? Is it an American white male? Is it, you know, right? So, so how do we kind of take that data and utilize it in a way that eliminates bias when there's so many openings for actually exacerbating it? Um, similar to the resume scrubbing, a hiring manager also eventually has to meet the person. Um, so the tools don't eliminate implicit bias or uh, uh, unconscious bias in the entire hiring process. And also it can leave the employer open to the same issues I discussed before with the resume scrubbing uh, software. There's also, if you Google, um, there are a ton of websites that post sample questions that are used often on these, um, these tools. And there are even how-tos on acing a video interview of this type. So the reliability of the, the data is also in question. So these are all things that, that um, clients should be made aware of if they are intending on using such AI. Um, lastly, now we have a, a workplace of workers, right? And AI is now being used. Um, it's actually a very young application of AI, but it's being used within companies uh, to utilize, um, or sorry, to attempt to eliminate bias and discrimination in promotions and moving uh, employees within the workplace. So um, it's basically predicated on behavior and work style traits. A worker would be given a questionnaire, they fill out the questionnaire, the data is mined and kept. When a job opening hap uh, happens to come uh, up, the employer then works with this third-party vendor uh, that handles the AI tech. They come up with a list of the skills and traits that the best person for this job would, would have. Um, and then they cross-run this information and get candidates within the organization who would be best for the job, um, or in theory, best for the job. So what's interesting about some of the preliminary results on this is that uh, it seems to be narrowing somewhat of the gender disparity in what women, uh, what types of jobs women will apply for typically and versus what types of jobs men will. Um, it also has a way of kind of blowing the, the traditional ideal out uh, for instance, a degree or a certificate that it, maybe it's a must have in a job description. A lot of times, according to this science, the best uh, applicant or candidate for the job wouldn't necessarily have that, but they have all of these other skills that would make them successful at the position. Um, you know, so certainly we can see some of the benefits of this. Again, it's incredibly young just yet, so it's, it's gotta be fleshed out to the extent that it can uh, eliminate some uh, gender gaps, certainly in the pay gap, that would be amazing. Um, I could also see that if a company is brought up on claims to, uh, of you know, discrimination in, higher, in uh, promotion and, and uh, upward mobility within the company, using this type of AI would be a nice defense that the company's paying attention to this and utilizing tools and spending money and you know, uh, trying to um, combat the uh, implicit bias. Um, however, you know, like, like all algorithms that are out there, someone has to set the skills and the work style that's ideal for the job. And so again, who's, who's that person? Um, so like I said, that's in, in the very, it's in its infancy at the moment, so we're, we're gonna be seeing how that plays out.
So um, some takeaways, answers, solutions, um, you know, in, in accordance with the rules of professional responsibility and ethical obligations, we as lawyers to employers need to be paying attention uh, to everything that is uh, rapidly changing in this space. Um, we have an obligation to uh, notify our clients of the potential exposures uh, using certain tools and so some of the weaknesses with those tools. Um, although the application of a lot of these uh, AI solutions in employment haven't been taken to task in the court system yet, uh, I think a competent attorney really needs to kind of think outside the box, understand the laws, understand the tech that's being utilized, and, and um, you know, use the independent thinking that, that Mr. Friedman had uh, spoken about before that is, that is absolutely necessary as part of our job to foresee some of these risks coming down the pike. Um, longer term solutions, not as easy. Really, there seems to be these two schools of thought. Uh, internal regulation, so tech companies ethically regulating themselves versus external regulation, which would be the government regulating through legislation. I think both uh, would help alleviate an attorney's ethical duty to advise their client about emerging AI that we may not be all that well versed in. Um, because as of right now, there's really no set of regulations internal or external. Um, so uh, as these things, you know, it, it's gonna, they, some of the things as Mr. Friedman had touched upon, you know, ethical panels and boards and, and some legislation has been uh, implemented in, in other countries, but I think we're still at a very early stage in figuring out how to regulate this. Um, one thing is clear with venture capital uh, investment last year increasing by 72% in AI technology over the year before, we are just getting started. So we'll see what's in store. So, so Adam, um, Alton and Golden was involved in really, I think, uh, the first two efforts to um, to litigate in this area. So hopefully you'll be able to talk a little bit about that. I know that many people have mentioned those cases during this conference. But here's where I want to start. I remember when um, I became the dean at Rutgers and I left, you told me, you need to require your law students to take a coding class. And I'm like, that's crazy. Like, you need to require them to take the coding class. Um, and now, as we have these discussions a year later, I think you're kind of right. Do you want to talk about that a little bit and then jump into your presentation? Yeah, thanks, David. So in 1987, I took Pascal coding at Cornell. I was a uh, ILR student, uh, uh, and uh, I didn't do well in that class. And I will tell you, it was the best class I took at the school. Uh, and I, you know, so I was going to just sort of open this with how many folks here have taken a computer programming class? pretty good. It's more than I would have expected. So I would describe that as a core competency for any lawyer that's working in this space. Um, and, and that's probably just the, um, the entry level, competency level uh, that's required in order to even uh, understand the use of machine learning. I'll get back to that point. Let me just start uh, at a, uh, just as an observation. So I'll try to bring a unique perspective to this program and this panel. I'm a plaintiff side civil rights lawyer. Um, I do prosecute um, impact in class litigation relating to hiring selection, um, pay equity, and uh, promotion and use of performance metrics um, in terms of gender and racial equity, pay equity, uh, promotion opportunities. And so th that's a uh, sort of a well-established field. Um, it's, uh, you know, there are several different components to it. Um, and so I sort of look at the issue of using uh, these automated systems or technology generally in the context of what has been established particularly around hiring selection since around the end of World War II. So if you look at um, industrial organizational psychology, use of side principles, use of hi sort of uh, professionalized hiring selection procedures, that's a, uh, a field that has been in existence for around 70 years or so, basically after World War II. And the idea really is can we identify basic competencies and find people that map onto those competencies for particular kinds of jobs? It's a pretty simple concept. And so what you would normally do if you were an IO psychologist is to look at the root knowledge, skills, abilities, or sometimes competencies, a different way of thinking of it, what are the requirements, competencies of the job, and then how do you map on um, to those competencies? How do you measure them in, in your applicant pool? It's a very simplistic way of thinking of it, 
and it really relates to um, the particular aptitude or abilities of uh, candidates for jobs. And in hiring selection, we've challenged those kinds of systems relating to the use of criminal history records um, as a screen for employment or denial of access to uh, employment opportunities based on those kind of characteristics. Uh, we've looked at things like immigration, you know, DACA status as a barrier to entry, looked at use of uh, credit history as a screen, uh, physical fitness tests, so I've done uh, cases involving uh, the use of uh, a run test in the state of Connecticut for corrections officers. Anyway, the point is there's a lot here that uh, has been, has been litigated, has been developed uh, for a very long time. In fact, uh, I think Jenny mentioned uh, the Uniform Guidelines. Uh, they were uh, promulgated in 1974. So this is not a, this is not a new concept or field. Uh, that's sort of one piece of it. The, the other piece uh, relates to the use of performance metrics uh, for making uh, employment decisions, particularly compensation pr and promotion decisions. And I'll tell you that I think there, um, you know, there, there is a real problem in terms of the accuracy of precision of those uh, kinds of performance metrics in terms of whether or not you're seeing true differences in, in outcomes in terms of performance or what it means to identify imp incumbent employees who are uh, performing at a high level versus a low level. How do you distinguish those uh, different characteristics or traits and then use that information uh, for the AI uh, field? And let me get back to that. So I would say broadly speaking from a litigation perspective and to David's point, you know, we looked at um, one aspect is sort of hiring, I'll call it sourcing and recruiting more specifically, the use of these sort of very efficient sort of Facebook marketing, largely marketing, target marketing strategies that employers had deployed through the Facebook platform where they would basically target using psychodemographic uh, filters or limitations. And there's an obvious reason to do it, right? F Facebook has roughly three billion uh, users on its system. You simply couldn't push out uh, an ad for pick a company and have it delivered to three billion people. First off, you as users would get frustrated with the Facebook platform, you'd, you'd be getting too many ads. And second, it's not relevant to you. Like, why do I get ads? I don't want to be a cat groomer. Um, you know, stop sending me that ad. You'd get very frustrated very quickly. So there's sort of a, an obvious reason why Facebook would want to use um, an AI technology to basically calibrate the ad in terms of relevance and target audience based on psychodemic uh, graphic uh, characteristics. And it's very good at that. It's actually very easy to pick out things like race, uh, ethnicity, gender, age group. All those things are, are easily observable through proxy measures and behaviors. So it's a perfectly fine idea if you're really trying to target market based on psychodemographics. And, um, and it's, it's actually a very efficient uh, way to do it. For marketing purposes, that's generally what they came up with. Now, what happened was the genie got out of the bottle. So somebody had the bright idea of, well, let's just apply it to uh, hiring and, and sourcing and uh, credit and housing and other areas where there are anti-discrimination statutes that prohibit race and gender and age targeting specifically. In fact, there are specific publication provisions of those statutes independent of whether there's a, a difference in outcomes or treatment based on immutable characteristics. In other words, just the use of uh, advertisements that are um, based on or targeted or using uh, immutable characteristics, th that, that mere fact alone, the use of that information to publish ads has, uh, has uh, violated these statutes specifically by, uh, by, by rule for at least 30 years, if not longer, depending on which statute you're talking about. So um, it, you know, what, what had happened, and to answer David's point, what had happened was we had come across uh, Facebook ads where Facebook itself uh, told you why you got the ad. So we were, there's literally a button that says, why did you get this ad? And to be very direct with you, when I first saw this, uh, as we were thinking about bringing uh, this case, it didn't occur to me that Facebook would be that transparent. Like, I, I just, it just occurred, didn't think that they would be truthful in saying why uh, you got the ad, because it was based on gender and, and age, which is just an obvious violation of several different statutes. It just seemed crazy to me that they would do that um, at the time, and yet it turned out that that was the case. But it's very efficient, and it came from a different field entirely of the uh, using, use of targeted marketing uh, to direct advertisements to particular psychodemographic uh, groups as a means to basically be efficient with the use of uh, impressions or, or uh, click-throughs, in other words, to sell things. So if you're selling diapers, um, it's a very good strategy. So you don't want to sell, uh, send ads uh, to people that aren't, don't have kids or don't need diapers. That would be a waste of money. So let's target. Well, how do you do that? Well, age, right? Gender, right? Location, all those kinds of things, and just their behaviors as well. Um, all, those, all those characteristics can be sort of synthesized into a, 
an efficient marketing strategy. And I think generally speaking, the, the sort of the sourcing, recruiting, um, you know, finding applicants, pulling applicants to companies really came from that sort of selling diapers marketing world without really any regard to um, statutory discrimination claims or that using those kinds of um, characteristics to direct target ads actually does violate a number of different statutes simply by virtue of the publication provisions of those statutes. And so that's literally uh, what those cases are, are about. They're mainly um, you know, focused on segregating based on immutable characteristic as a violation of those statutes. Um, the idea, in particular, the Age Discrimination Employment Act, specifically was, uh, was enacted to avoid or dismantle age-segregated job posting ads in newspapers. That's literally, if you read the Wurtz Report, if you read the history of the idea, that was specifically what it was targeting initially, that older applicants were being denied employment categorically, explicitly through the use of uh, job ads that were age limited. So Facebook basically just used um, sort of those tools in a way that um, sort of deployed or leveraged the use of artificial intelligence. Going uh, to a different subject, which is uh, the use of uh, hiring itself. So I would describe sort of Facebook as sourcing, recruiting. The hiring selection uh, tools are really quite fascinating. So to go back to my earlier point about understanding coding, so um, you know, what, what is happening here is that you have sort of three components to these kinds of technology systems. Uh, basically, data, methods, and outcomes. So, um, generally speaking, the machine learning technology generally is being trained, um, looking at incumbent workers or some seed set or training set, saying here is the examples um, that we would like to find more of um, from the applicant pool. So we have Joe here, he's doing a great job, we have some measure of, of, of performance and we want to replicate uh, Joe and find more Joes. That's the idea. And, and what's sort of bizarre about all this is that it, um, whether Joe is a good employee or not, is sort of a subjective decision by the company based on some measure of performance. It, uh, a lot of those measures are imprecise, there's a lot of noise. Uh, there's something called a central uh, tendency bias, central tendency bias that basically uh, describes or points out that most people basically fall within a tight range or sort of average, if you like, sort of cluster around a mean. So what you find out when you look at performance measures, and I've seen this in lots of cases, is that everyone gets a B plus in essence. So if you had a grading scale between A and, and D, everyone gets an A minus or B plus. Just teeters between those two points. So you're pretty good but not great, you're not awful. And there's some, you know, and basically there's, you know, it's, there's um, a lot of compression in terms of those scores. So what are you supposed to, do? so if you think about it logically, if that's true, so what you're doing is you're taking um, central tendency bias or very compressed scores and then trying to differentiate based on those characteristics in terms of how the machine learning works, in terms of, of deploying a training set. And it fundamentally doesn't work because what you're doing is you're forcing a distribution on noise, in essence. You're saying that there's some meaningful difference in outcomes based on uh, very compressed uh, performance metrics and that aren't very valuable anyway because they're not measuring an awful lot. The other thing that you see a lot um, is um, psychodemographic profiling. So we had you heard about this, so psychometrics, gamification of psychometrics, so psychological profiles, the sort of big five personality inventory, sort of psychological profiling using public source scrape data. So these are unstructured data sources that companies are using. Um, Conexa, for example, which is now IBM, will public source scrape data uh, as a feed, as a tr essentially a data source. And, and a couple things about psychometrics. One, um, it's not entirely clear what the characteristics that are being used are that correlate to whether somebody is um, hired or considered to, uh, to be suitable for employment or not. They're not basing it on competencies and knowledge, skills, and abilities of the job, they're basing it on some characteristic that can be described in the psychometrics domain that doesn't relate to actually any um, evidence of performance of a job. Um, the other thing is that it turns out that uh, psychometrics or personalities or um, personality traits are not stable. They're, uh, they're generally contextualized, so it turns out your personality will shift depending on context, it's not stable, so it's, uh, it's not rigid in that sense. Um, so depending on the context and um, depending on interactions with the environment and um, basically depending on what it is that we're talking about, you have different uh, personality inventory uh, scores for uh, a given different context. And so it's not even clear to me that uh, there's really evidence of stability in terms of the measures. There was an early point of a rep 
uh, replication of, the, of outcomes. So if you have a, uh, a domain that's being measured that's not stable, you'll not, you'll not get a reputable outcome. And the other thing I'll, I'll probably uh, discuss is that, so the question of validity, um, correlation versus causation. This is really, I think, at the core, as I think about it as a plaintiff side, uh, so rights lawyer, at the core of, of what would be the attack of any of these systems. So if you have adverse impact, which would be a requirement of, of any disparate impact analysis, um, the question is, can you defend any of these practices, any uh, AI systems uh, under the concepts of validity, um, meaning that there's, there's a true causality between some measured uh, input or measured uh, characteristic of the applicant and then some output measure that's important to the job. So if you think about it, you know, in the very obvious uh, context of like, a firefighter, there's some minimum requirement they are able to carry equipment uh, in order to, uh, to go to a fire. So there's, there's some standards that you could establish around physical capacity. Um, using AI technology, and particularly around psychometrics, it's not entirely clear to me what, what that would look like, how an employer would, would explain the validity of psychometrics or psychological profiles. What, is the, what would be the minimum score? How stable uh, would those uh, measures be? And what's the cut score? So, you know, in the machine learning world, it's uh, precision and recall, not validity. So those are the sort of the indicators. It's sort of the same idea around um, what is it that the system is actually measuring and how good is it at it? How predictive, how useful is the information in terms of making decisions? And because it's largely a black box and there's a hidden layer in the use of uh, structured, unstructured machine learning, depending on sort of the context, it's not susceptible to, um, to auditing in the same way that you could look at a test or, or other kinds of uh, hiring selection procedures that, um, where there is a sort of a record of what happened. And so I think it's almost impossible to have an intelligent conversation with an employer uh, that, that deploys these kinds of technologies in terms of, well, you know, what is the minimum threshold for validity? What is your evidence of validity? Um, do you even know? How predictive is it? What's the minimum requirement for predictive validity before you can deploy these technologies if there's evidence of adverse impact? What does it even look like? Um, did you measure it? What is the measurement of that? Uh, and and uh, sort of my sense of it is that you know, fundamentally there's just a, a, a total disconnect between the world of um, uniform guidelines, the world of uh, SI principles and sort of well-established uh, standards for hiring selection, suitability determinations, with the use of these AI technologies. They, they don't really speak the same language at all. And I would say, I know this is an ethics panel, I would say in terms of lawyers working in this field, uh, I think it's incredibly troubling that you as a lawyer uh, exercising your independent uh, judgment in terms of making critical decisions about your client's uh, conduct, that uh, you don't have a, a particularly good understanding of the technology, the methods that are being used, um, and, and whether they are appropriate or not. Um, I, so I, I would say, you know, one of the things I, I like to say is uh, prove the null hypothesis that what you're seeing is simply a random number generator. Like prove, prove that what you're seeing is not a random number generator. How would you to prove it? How would you know that? At a minimum, to, you know, just to make the point, if you're uh, interviewing these vendors, what is their evidence that their product is not a random number generator? I don't think there's a single person in this room could answer that question right now. <laughs> Random number generator, dice, game of chance, throw it down the staircase. So but the problem is there's no way to know, right? Because what they're saying, what these companies are telling you is that it's a black box, it's proprietary. Um, you know the data, they don't describe the methods or outcomes. And so it's not repeatable. It's not even clear it's stable, much less valid or predictive of any particular outcome that's meaningful in the employment setting. And to my mind, I've not seen any evidence of validity. I've not seen anyone say that they have evidence of validity. I've heard, trust me, I've heard it works great. <laughs> and they're debiasing and don't worry about it. Okay, I love the, you know, that's great. Sign me up, folks. Uh, sounds like the kind of case that uh, we, we challenge all the time. I often describe my job as challenging normative behavior. Um, take criminal history records as a screen for employment. Love, you know, that's, that's an example where it seems plausible until you really sort of think about um, how you define a cut score. What's the minimum standards? That, everyone, really, who has ever had any interaction with the criminal justice system that can't ever be employed in the U.S. economy ever again? Sure. Uh, 
Is this, you know, how would you differentiate that kind of blunt instrument approach to, um, in this field? How, would, what's the, how do you have an intelligent conversation around these concepts? Um, who's out there? Who came to this conference to tell me the answer to my question? Is it a random number generator? Anyone got an answer to that? I'm just wondering. Okay. Well, it's cheaper, easier, and faster, clearly. So you can replace your HR department. It's like the, I remember War Games, the Whopper, the, the computer that replaced human beings and it wound up starting World War III. I mean, it's really good, it's very fast. I mean, my phone could, the truth is, if you gave me a list of 10 million people and told me to hire 12, my phone could do it, right? I would just, I mean, just hit the random number generator thing, take three milliseconds. I'm not making that up, by the way. That's literally true. So how is it different than my phone? So, so um, I'm not sure that you'd want to call Dr. Stoyanovich, uh, because I know that um, she's really drilled down on issues of the black box and transparency, and she wants to talk about that. But before we jump into that, are there any questions? Does anybody <laughs> want to jump in um, in response to anything that we've heard today? Because I, I want just to comment on the random number generator. Okay, let's, that, let's. That this is, it, it's, and thank you. Uh, it's really not a random sort of a thought, right? So I spoke at one point to uh, mm -hmm. a panel about the use of PSA in the bail reform in New Jersey. Mm -hmm. And I was asking repeatedly, how do you know that it works? What are its objectives? What are the objectives of the bail reform and, what, and of the use of PSA? And they said, well, release 80% of people uh, pending trial on bail, right? So this is a clear case where a random number generator, a coin that is 80%, 20%, mm -hmm. right, is something with which you should compare. N yet no comparisons have been made. Right, and it's impossible to know. I mean, that's, you know, it's even worse than that because at least in, at least in that context, you have, you have a control set. Mm -hmm back here at the microphone. So I, I do have a question, uh, maybe it's more of a comment, but um, it seems to me that all these tools are, are really trying to get at two things. Either you have unconscious bias or you have an institutional uh, problem or you're considering variables which amount to institutional bias. Has the thought ever been given that the profiles, if you're trying to reverse engineer, that the profiles of a successful woman and a successful man and a successful black male, you, we could go on, are not necessarily all the same. Hmm. That is that if you're looking for people who you know, sell 100 widgets a year mm -hmm. and those are the people mm -hmm. you want and you reverse, try mm -hmm. to figure out well, who are these people are, where they come mm -hmm. from, the profiles I'm suggesting to mm -hmm. you are all going to be possibly different. Mm -hmm. So if you build it the other way, which I heard conversations earlier today and you're a Fortune 500 company of your thousands of employees and it's mostly going to be white males just by number if, if we go by demographics of, 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 of these kind of companies, that profile is not going to necessarily reflect either the characteristics of what could be a successful white woman or a successful black male, it's gonna be overwhelmingly built on the wrong profile. And again, uh, a, a biased um, sort of result. Uh, on the other hand, if you're the Fortune 500 company and you say, oh, well, you know, our profile, we don't have enough African American males. And let's build a profile of a successful African American male and let's look for that person using those variables, I think you open yourself also up to possibly uh, litigation of a different sort. Anyway, I just, the question was, in, in these discussions, whether anyone considered that there are different profiles of successful people in different, in the different subcategories. Hmm. You know about the college? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think it's it's something that I touched upon. I mean, who's the one setting the data set, right? Is it an American white male? 
And if so, it's going to be inherently skewed. Um, I think the, the video interviewing in, mm -hmm. uh, in particular lends itself to that. I had, a, I had a question for Professor Stojanovich. I thought from your presentation, basically you said, because we live in an, in, in an imperfect world, we have an original data set that's imperfect. Right. And then you apply all this stuff to it, and you're just going to get these imperfect results because the original data set was imperfect. And we had some speakers yesterday, I think even today was alluded to, but see, there's companies out there that take this imperfect data set, and then we scrub it, and we make it perfect. Mm -hmm. And then we apply these things. I got the impression from you that you really can't scrub that and make it perfect. You, you cannot uh, fix technologically, fix a problem that technology did not create. You can mitigate things, right? You can be deliberate about uh, injecting statistical bias so as to counteract societal bias, for example, right? This is essentially what affirmative action style interventions in machine learning do. But I don't think that we can claim to fix uh, solutionism is, is just, and I love this quote, solutionism uh, is the, reductionism is the only deadly sin. And so in the case of you know, AI in society, solutionism is, is that sin. We can't scrub data uh, because the world will produce more data of the same kind and feed it into the same pipeline, right? We just need to understand what the limits are of, of technological interventions. Uh, so I think the answer to the question of you know, how do we fix bias is we need to be transparent. Transparency is the answer to the question of, of fairness somehow. Can I just add to that very quickly? So there is sort of another fundamental problem in, in addition to the sort of uh, the data sources, which is I'll call it practical significance, for lack of a better term. Essentially, the idea that um, so if you rank order 100 people, you'll have a list, 1 to 100, right? That's always true. But what if 1 to 10 look almost identical, that the differences are infinitesimal, and it's noise, basically. In other words, it's within the margin of error, that the, 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 the differences in measured uh, characteristics are literally statistically identical for all purposes. It's literal noise. The problem with these technologies is that there's no way to identify practical significance or that what you're seeing is a meaningful difference in characteristics that drives differences in outcomes. Fundamentally, that's the problem. There are ways to tell, but you need to pay attention to this, right? We don't usually pay attention to the fact that differences are very, very small because we just go after this, you know, success, highest score, done. Yeah. Okay. Oh, you yeah. want to go for, I know you've been waiting. Go ahead. No, go ahead. I'm sorry. You've been waiting. I know you've been waiting. Why don't you go? What if um, my uh, company's experience is that uh, in the business that I'm in and who they have to see, white males generate a larger amount of sales than black males, mm -hmm. and I'm going to hire a new uh, salesperson? What should we do about that? Well, my uh, well, we should regulate. Uh, yeah. No, no. I, I, have st I, I live in New York. I have statistics. I'm selling something, and uh, my statistics indicate that a white male salesman will bring in a larger gross than a black male salesman. So I'm looking for a new salesperson, mm -hmm. and I want to say I want to hire a white guy. Well, you can inverse it and say I want to hire a black guy because a black guy will bring in more sales than who I'm selling to. May I, or just uh, Well, I'll just say, I, I, you know, I, so the, the question empirically is, is, are there race differences in performance, or is it, are there race different, are there true race differences in performance, which I don't believe would be the case, or is there something about the system itself that is racially biased, so access and opportunity to clients, um, perhaps uh, customer preference around race, perhaps um, opportunities for mentorship, uh, there are lots of different inputs in terms of uh, differences in out outcomes. And I mean, customer bias, right? Customer bias could be one of the impacts, yeah. Right. There are lots of reasons for it that have nothing to do with the so skin the color. Hiring someone to increase my growth, right? Well, what I'm saying is the race is not, skin color is not driving any outcome. You're, you're as, uh, assigning an outcome based on skin color is not a tr true correlation. I'm assigning choice based upon my company's numbers as to who can get me more sales with respect to the population. Well, I'm going to turn over to the former general yeah. counsel of the EOC. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Don't do it. <laughs>
Did you want to? Did you want to win? Yeah. So I, I, I can give a kind of a technical answer. Uh, so uh, we know what the Rooney rule is, uh, right? So it's it's kind of the lowest bar for diversity in hiring that that exists. When you interview people, you should be sure to interview at least one uh, candidate from an underrepresented group. And this started with the NFL, I believe, where they interviewed for head coaches and they wanted to interview at least one African American for each position. Um, so it has actually been shown mathematically uh, that if the baseline ability of the candidates does not depend uh, on their membership in a protected group, so does not depend on race in this case, but you have an innate bias in your hiring, <coughs> then it's still, even for utility arguments, uh, it makes sense to uh, adhere to the Rooney rule because ultimately it gives you a higher utility uh, hiring pool and you hire high u higher utility candidates. It what? works out because you basically you need to give yourself an opportunity to explore, not only to exploit, this is in computational terms. If you've never seen a black swan in your data, you're not gonna know that a black swan would be, you know. I've I used blue collar, but I really shouldn't. Doesn't I'm selling, I'm We're all friends a, here. I bring a salesman in, I'm selling to Irish people, the Irish salesman would be better. My question is, no, my question is, the bias is here is directed at the result that the hire will deliver. It's not based upon whether I don't like Irish people or Jewish people or black people. I want to get a number. The same in the basketball game. I want a guy who scores more points. So I, you know, these people go to that area, and a person of that ethnic or racial background would be better in that area. And freedom of association. Now, I mean, the, the, the point I was going to bring that freedom of association would solve all these issues because, you know, I'm, a, I'm a free to associate with anybody I want. So I'm wondering how legally, if, if people invoke that, uh, that, uh, that principle to get out of discrimination uh, 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 cases against them in the private sector, because if the, 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 to my best interest, I should be hiring a certain person or another person, you know, I should be able to make that decision, that freedom of association. Now, I, I, have, a, I have a very, very core objection to the quote-unquote scientific presentation of uh, Professor Stojanovic because it's based on statistics. And statistics, especially in, so, in, in sociological data, is based on false aggregation. You can not add me and her and him. We're different entities. Yes, we are human beings, but we're different. Mm -hmm. So, and, and back to the, to, the, to the criticism about, for example, uh, um, um, uh, convictions or, or uh, court decisions against like race. I have never heard anybody challenge what, have any of these decisions actually been unfair? Have they been reversed? On appeal, I haven't seen that that, that research. That, 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 that the, the research you quote goes the extra step to see if indeed those seemingly at first level racially motivated or biased decisions were actually uh, correct or wrong. But and yeah. this, we cannot do it unless we do it case by case, mm -hmm. which answers the question, uh, I, can, I can hire uh, like a person, I can have like a pool of five candidates and I can hire the one which would make me look like a racially uh, uh, biased, but actually I'm not racially biased, okay? Because it's case by case, like, like the, the one person could prove to be the, 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 the best candidate. Like the, the person who is like against my uh, uh, racial motivations. I don't know that. So. I, I think we have a, have a very serious methodological problem here. We're adding things that are not equal, and only if we do it case by case. Like, we have to argue a, each case for every person where they racially uh, um, profile, because we, we may end up doing discrimination of the majority, and that's also racism. Huh. Doing racism against the majority is also racism. I mean, uh, doing racism against the minority is what we are preoccupied now, and that's good, but reversing it, doing racism against the majority, that, that, that's also wrong. And I think we're going in that direction. And I don't think we, we, we should go in that direction. So that, the, I mean, was that your question? I'm sorry, were you done? <laughs> yes, so, so fallacy, fallacy if, I can, if I can recap. 
uh, uh, fallacy of composition. In other words, uh, doing aggregation with uh, uh, things which are different. We cannot be adding them together, and that's what the statistics does. And then, um, and, and then the, the freedom of association. What, what, what does that play here? Okay. So uh, as far as fallacy in, in statistics, so let me just recap the study that ProPublica did. They looked at whether or not individuals, specific individuals, were rearrested three years down the road from when the risk score was produced for them. And what they found was that for specific individuals, and by the way, race was not one of the inputs to the tool, the false positive rates and the false negative rates differed by race. But these are individual cases. Right. You cannot aggregate them and say, oh, well, well, 60% whites like uh, recommitted crimes. No, it depends on the case, depends on the person, depends on the context. You cannot be adding them. That's my, my comment about fallacy of composition. You said, sure, you can add them and come up with that result. But that's, I think it's a, it's a logically incorrect method to, 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 uh, to, uh, to be doing yeah. assessment. I mean, I, th I and, think... And, and, also, and also a secondary step is that even if the algorithm produces that, uh, that bias, in a second step, you should educate the algorithm to correct for that. Do they do that? No, of course they don't do that. So. In fact, it, it amplifies the bias that is already in the system. So, of course, if an algorithm makes aggregate choices, then it is absolutely valid to validate it using aggregate choices. Yeah. Now, you can, of course, object to using information of the sort that the algorithm uses to make predictions of the sort. And on that, I agree with you. Yeah. But once you've stepped into the realm of doing statistical risk prediction, mm -hmm. then there has to be a statistical validation of that prediction. And, and then from a legal matter, I mean, you're, you're, you're raising some, I think, deep conceptual philosophical issues. But from a legal matter, um, the whole notion of disparate impact has been codified into the statute. So you know, the whole analysis of looking at aggregate impact on groups, that is the law. That is the law. That's been codified. That was voted on by Congress. Both senators from Mississippi, both senators from Texas, they all voted in favor of it. It was 93 to 5 vote. So that's the law. So, you know, whether you don't like the law, that's one thing. Anyway. And also whether or not there is symmetry, there's always argument, right? So Ricci v. Di Stefano showed us that the uh, Supreme Court with uh, sort of Kennedy as the leading opinion agrees with you that there should be symmetry with respect to how you treat race. I personally side with Ginsburg, who wrote a dissenting opinion. <laughs> You've been so patient. Yes. <laughs> uh, Lisa Burnt, uh, Fair Employment Project in Cambridge. My question is for Adam. Um, in your firm, you're, you're talking about these uh, cases. I'm curious as to the cases that you've litigated. Um, specifically, I'm looking at, I'm interested in failure to hire cases, mm -hmm. external candidates, so they're especially ignorance about the process. Have you had any of those cases and how did they know? Like <laughs> what, what made them think, huh, I didn't get right. hired and what the hell? And I better call out and golden. Like how did they even know? You know, that's, that's an issue. Uh, I right. mean, the EEOC numbers, the Commission right. Against Discrimination totally, totally Act, there are hardly the any failure to hire cases even so, before AI, so, so how did they know? It's I guess. even worse than that because in the Facebook context, uh, by definition, uh, my clients, did not receive an ad that they didn't know existed. <laughs> so it's a really hard problem. Um, so what we did, it's sort of fascinating in a way. So I became a labor lawyer. And what I mean by that is uh, my client in the T-Mobile case is the Communication Workers of America and their 800,000 union members around the country. Thank you, CWA. Um, and they stepped forward and became our institutional plaintiff. And organized labor stepped up and decided to take a, uh, a stand and to combat technology discrimination in the U.S. workforce that affects, impacts their members. And I avoided that problem. Hi, I'm Marcia Adams, uh, Region 29 of NLRB. Um, my question, you had talked about, um, I think Mr. Klein, about the uh, software scrubbing resumes um, and I guess eliminating, um, I, I was just curious how that works and how far and do they scrub and does it take into account um, the situation where the person with the name um, that was mentioned uh, in a previous uh, um, uh, slide, uh, does that, would that wipe out that person's name from her? 
her resume? Or I'm just I, curious. I, I think you were talking about that. Yeah, um, I, my understanding of it is yes, name is probably the first mm -hmm. and foremost piece of mm -hmm. information that, that goes based upon the evidence that Julia was talking about mm -hmm. in terms of names um, giving rise to mm -hmm. conscious or unconscious mm -hmm. bias. Um, uh, so that's certainly part of it. But again, at some point, you have to meet this this person. So these these ideas of that we're mm -hmm. eliminating um, all bias in the hiring process by simply getting rid of the name and the address that has a lot to do with it as well. You know, it, there's assumptions about people who come from certain neighborhoods versus others. Um, it, you know, all of that actually has to be known at some point, mm -hmm. and at that point, how is it dealt with? Um, so. It's effective at that first level, making everybody equal, you know, uh, in terms of just job experience, because that's essentially all that's left, right? When you take out the, the school they went to, the year they graduated, because that indicates age, uh, their neighborhood, their, hmm. their name, um, all that's left is really just work experience. So everybody kind of starts at that, that neutral place, but there has to be that next step. So, but th there is a, a problem uh, as well, which is that it's really hard to um, shield uh, demographic or psychodemographic information, even when you scrub out those kinds of obvious indicators. So, for example, for example, it's fascinating. IBM connects us. So, if you could throw any written uh, word work at their uh, insight tool, and it will do things like uh, determine uh, usage, grammar usage, word usage, uh, education, ethnicity. Uh, proxies for gender, race. So what they do is instead of saying it's a binary, this is a woman or a man, or a person of color or white or what have you, they think of it in probabilistic terms. And so you have conference intervals. And so, and it's really uh, very simple for these systems to essentially assign probabilistic characteristics based on any information at all, including public source unstructured scrape data. So they'll go out and look for information to enrich the data streams that they're deploying, but at its core, it's almost impossible to strip away immutable characteristics from almost any piece of information that's being processed through AI technology. Mm -hmm. hey. Thank you. Um, um, I was really excited by this panel. Um, the conversation has seemed to like evolve a little bit more into like methodology with this specific talk, so that my question's about that. Um, and it's two parts, so I think in response to the kind of alternative, a sort of radical alternative of case-by-case case literal analysis, I think the problem with that philosophically, which is an area I'm comfortable talking about, though I'm not a lawyer, um, is that you end up denying social constructs even exist. Like, you, you end up denying that we can have discussions about, um, for instance, the voting patterns of Democrats or these, um, Per, things that African Americans buy as opposed to other demographics. So the idea that we can't describe or a, attribute discrimination to a group is denying, I think, just a fact of the world that these groups exist and they are treated according, accordingly. Even if we deny that race is a real thing, which there's research, I mean, that's a valid perspective of denial that it's a real thing. in in any biological sense, we still operate in the world in a way that it is. So from a legal perspective, we have to factor in fairness into, like we have to actually work on that. So that was my response to that. Um, obviously, feel free to respond to that, but I think you already, in saying it's codified in the law, have essentially confirmed we must operate with those assumptions. My question is for Klein. Um, you expressed a lot of um, skepticism about like industrial organizational uh, psychometrics. You sort of ex have expressed skepticism that at least the kind of psychometric work that higher view might use or a, some of these companies might use, that they're actually valid, that they're actually um, beneficial to use. The, Concern I have with that is, do you deny um, the whole field of psychology and, and industrial organizational psych as a whole? First off, that we can't even engage in this kind of research. And two, if you commit to doing that, 
do you do you see that do you not think that there's a possibility that eventually the algorithms will get better than human judgment cuz arguably that will happen so obviously I, i'm a subscriber of psychology and use of psychometrics that's not the point the point is um, is there a, a true diff, a true measured outcome difference that's important to the workplace that um, doesn't implicate disparate impact analysis where you don't have gender or race differences in outcomes and so um, basically, the question is, are the use of psychometrics, are they revealing true differences in applicants that are meaningful in terms of job performance or something relevant in the workplace? Because you're not, underscored, not measuring core job competencies. In other words, the ability or demonstrated ability to do the work, which would be a different way of thinking of it and has been the way that I, as psychologists, have approached this problem for near 65, 70 years, which is to look at the so-called knowledge, skills, abilities, and other characteristics, sort of the requirements of the job, and then find people who can meet those needs. Psychometrics doesn't address that at all. So like an intelligent IQ test as a psychometric analysis, mm -hmm. would that meet your standard or not? No, an IQ test, oh. well, first off, there are race differences in, in uh, cognitive ability test, putting that aside, even if it were um, race neutral, again, what is it that you're measuring? It depends on the job. So for example, there are lots of jobs where physically showing up to work and being able to uh, respond to simple directions, think of a cashier at Target. What would the IQ test measure exactly? Or more, it's, it's not really tailored to the requirements of the job. Moreover, it's, it's probably an insufficient measure of general ability or competencies relating to the specifics of the job. So think of physical fitness tests or other attributes that are rel job relevant beyond uh, IQ tests. So it's an incomplete measure of, of performance. Okay. One, one more question, one more question. We've got to let everybody go home. We have it? If there are no questions, oh. uh, may I make a statement um, or a couple of statements? Um, first of all, I want to thank the panel on behalf of the audience. This, I think, in the 12 years that I've been doing this, is the largest crowd we've had on Friday afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> and, <laughs> as, as you all know, we, uh, I guess this is a trade secret, but you all know it, we put the milk in the back of the grocery store, right? So the ethics panel comes last, and it's hard for the audience, and especially on a Friday in summer, but this has been a real treat, and I thank all of you. Um, and um, Sam Estreicher had to leave um, for a you know, family emergency, actually, but apparently things are okay. But he did have to leave, and I, I want to thank you all for coming and participating. We will be sending by email the CLE certificates in about a week. They won't be ready this coming week, but they will be ready the week after. And if I may be indulged uh, to say something, um, and I, um, which I found quite interesting, um, and no one has addressed, is the etymology of the word algorithm. And very briefly, it comes from um, eighth century Arabic texts introducing the use of numerals into, into arithmetic algebra and the creation of mathematics. And it comes from a man from an Arab area called Khwarizmum. And he was called the Harizmini or Al Harizma. And that eventually came into European languages as algorithm. And it comes from sort of something as uh, accidental and personal as that. So, with that important fact, which we will include in the credit for CLE, <laughs> thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you.